While McCarthyism made headlines, a quieter form of American conservatism was taking shape. For the first time, a self-identified conservative movement was becoming intellectually influential in America. One part of it was traditionalist. Historians like Ross Hoffman rediscovered the wisdom of Edmund Burke and argued that it was as timely to America facing the threat of communism as it had been to England facing the threat of the French Revolution 200 years before. Richard Weaver, a literature scholar at the University of Chicago, looked even further back for inspiration and in his book Ideas Have Consequences, lamented what he thought of as the decline of civilization since the Christian Middle Ages. The most widely noticed traditionalist of the early 1950s was Russell Kirk, whose book The Conservative Mind traced an Anglo-American conservative lineage from Burke down to such giants of his own era as T.S. Eliot. Weaver, Kirk and Hoffman all believed in the natural law, the idea that positive laws ought to follow the structure of being that could be discovered in nature itself. This principle, strong in Catholic tradition, caught on widely in the 1950s, even among non-Catholic writers like Walter Lippmann and Peter Vierek, contributing a new respectability to conservative ideas. While America after World War II enjoyed a massive rise in living standards, and idolized innovation and up-to-dateness, a group of conservative intellectuals was making the case for remembering and venerating tradition. Richard Weaver argued that Western civilization should look back to its classical and medieval heritage. His book Ideas, of Conse Ideas Have Consequences was published in 1948 and in it he traced the modern fallacies all the way back to the work of William of Ockham one of the scholastic theologians who died in the year 1349. Weaver himself was a professor of literature at the University of Chicago, a southerner but a man who never really fitted in in the Windy City. He'd studied with the southern agrarians in Nashville, that um, agrarian group from the south before the, before the Second World War, and he'd done his PhD at LSU, Louisiana State University. He lamented the defeat of the south in the Civil War because with its defeat, America had lost an example of a society dedicated to benign hierarchy, gentility, and tradition. It seemed clear enough to Weaver that the world was getting worse, not better, especially in light of the Second World War and its incredible destructiveness. And he wanted it to call his book The Fearful Descent. He was a philosophical idealist who sought the causes of decline in ideas. And he found it in an unlikely place the work of William Ockham, William of Ockham, his fateful advocacy of scholastic nominalism instead of scholastic realism. Let me just briefly explain those two ideas. In scholastic theology, the realists had this idea that there are certain objects like uh, chairs, for example, uh, and every chair you've got is an approximation to the ideal chair, and that the, um, that the ideal is more real than the particular manifestations of that object. Chairs is an easy example because it's a concrete object. Now, but th and th those are the people who are called the realists. Now, by contrast, the nominalists, of whom Ockham was one, are people who say, we've got various objects upon all of which we can sit, and as a, as a term of linguistic convenience, we use the word chair, but that doesn't mean that there's some kind of essence of chairness. The only thing that we've really got is the particular objects themselves. That's nominalism. Now, Richard Weaver's point was that the sciences that we have today are the descendants of nominalism. They say that the only things which we can regard as, um, uh, as, as susceptible to accurate information are the, are the things which impinge upon our senses, which we can look at and hold and touch and smell and taste and see. And Weaver says, the issue ultimately involved is whether there is a source of truth higher than and independent of man. And the answer to the question is decisive for one's view of the nature and destiny of humankind. The practical result of nominalist philosophy is to banish the reality which is perceived by the intellect and to posit as reality that which is perceived by the senses. With this change in the affirmation of what is real, the whole orientation of culture takes a turn and we are on the road to modern empiricism.
He deplored the rise of scientific specialization, which was one of the characteristics of the 19th and 20th centuries. And he said, the long-term effect of Occam's nominalism is to think that nothing transcending experience can be regarded as real, whereas in his view, all the most real things were, were non-empirical. We get science, but science is only a truncated form of knowledge. Weaver was contemptuous of scientific over-specialization. In an age when it appeared to be bringing great technological progress, but certainly not of the kind that he could approve, this was a period, of course, when many people were having misgivings in view of the destructiveness to which science had been lent in the, in the, in the terrible wars of the first half of the century. At one interesting moment in Ideas Have Consequences, Richard Weaver cites Philip of Macedon telling his son, the man who was later to become Alexander the Great, about his flute playing, that he ought to be ashamed of playing it so well. That's a surprising remark. We think that to play a musical instrument well is good. But uh, Philip of Macedon's point, which Weaver echoes, is you ought not to be specialising in this way, especially you, who've got a, a leadership role to fulfil. Weaver favoured the ideal of fraternity over that of equality. I mean, characteristically for Weaver, he takes two of the phrases from the French Revolution, egality, fraternity and liberty, and puts two of them as, as antagonists. Fraternity, in his view, is the opposite of equality. And he says fraternity is the virtue we ought to emphasise because it's embedded in families themselves, families, the basic units of society. Here's how he thinks about it. The committee of people in groups, large or small, rests not upon the chimerical notion of equality, but upon fraternity, a concept which long antedates it in history because it goes immeasurably deeper in human sentiment. The ancient feeling of brotherhood carries obligations of which equality knows nothing. It calls for respect and protection, for brotherhood is status in family, and family is by nature hierarchical. It demands patience with little brother, and it may sternly exact duty of big brother. It places people in a network of sentiment, not of rights. Fraternity directs attention to others, equality to self. And the passion for equality is simultaneous with the growth of egotism. So in other words, as America becomes a more equal society, it becomes more egotistical. Societies most dedicated to equality, in Weaver's view, like contemporary America, were therefore the most selfish, envious and resentful. Another very interesting person from the same period is the Jesuit theologian John Courtney Murray, who also uh, argued for a renewed adherence to the natural law and claimed that it was embodied in American ideals and institutions. Murray was a Jesuit. He's famous as a liberal Catholic in some respects, particularly because he favoured religious toleration as the official Catholic policy. Now, up until the 1960s, the Catholic Church was kind of officially intolerant. It certainly enjoyed uh, the benefits of religious toleration in America so long as it was a minority faith but it aspired to an ideal condition of superiority when it would impose intolerance on everybody else, uh, with the reasoning that error has no rights. Now, Murray strongly deplored that view. He thought that everybody should have religious freedom and that they should come to the religious truth completely voluntarily. He was censured by his superiors in the 1950s and even silenced for a while, prevented from publishing some of his work. But then he was vindicated at the Second Vatican Council, which took place in Rome between 1962 and 65, uh, where he was recognised and honoured by being asked to author its Declaration on Religious Liberty. From the time of the Vatican Council onwards, religious liberty did become the official Catholic position. But although Murray was a religious liberal, he was a political conservative, a cold warrior of a very conservative kind who argued that the heritage of the medieval theologians, the scholastics, had been best preserved not in Europe, which had forgotten it in the age of royal absolutism, but in the Constitution and the Federalist Papers, which ironically, these American documents, had ironically conveyed into modern times the Catholic tradition of limited rule. In ingenious works, Murray traces these ideas of limited government back to their scholastic predecessors. Murray did for Catholic intellectuals what McCarthyism did for the Catholic masses. That is, to show the perfect congruence of Catholicism with America, 
even better than the condition of the Protestants. Other traditionalists in the 1940s and 50s argued that, in the face of communist threats, the wisdom of Edmund Burke was as relevant as it had been in the face of the French Revolution. The Burke revival in, in scholarship was begun by Ross Hoffman and Paul Levac in the 1940s. Ross Hoffman was another Catholic, a convert, who'd given up a good job as a professor at New York University for a much worse job at Fordham University, the Jesuit school, because of his faith he wanted to work in a Catholic environment. During the Second World War, Ross Hoffman argued passionately in favour of intervention in the war, as opposed to the Irish-American Catholics who were anti-British and therefore tended to favour the isolationist position. In Hoffman's view, Britain had now become the bearer of Christendom, the, the, the accumulated heritage of Christian tradition, over against the barbarism of the Nazis, and therefore must be supported. He began publishing on Edmund Burke after the war, emphasising that Nazism and Communism were to us what the Jacobins of the French Revolution had been to Burke. And in a, a daring rhetorical move, he said, Nazism was not a right-wing movement, it's a left-wing movement. The Nazis were national socialists, and the socialism in that phrase has to be emphasised. Like the Stalinists, they favoured concentrations of power in the great central government and the sweeping away of all forms of tradition in favour of this new and terrifying thing. Hoffman also emphasised that Edmund Burke stood squarely in the tradition of the natural law and was not a pragmatist. One of, Burke, uh, one of Hoffman's most influential books was The Spirit of Politics and the Future of Freedom, published in 1950. In it, Hoffman, like Murray, saw Catholics as leading a conservative revival, fortified by the work of Edmund Burke. I mentioned earlier in talking about Burke that there's always been some speculation that he might have been a Catholic. Of course, people, uh, writers like Hoffman had an obvious incentive for, for wanting him to be so. Now the world, uh, and, and in, in, in this book Hoffman argues as follows, the world since 1914 has been facing permanent revolution, quote, an evil so great that it sums up almost all the evils abounding in the nightmare of horror which has tortured the world during the past few decades. Lenin, Trotsky, Stalin, Hitler and Goebbels have been its outstanding practitioners. It is the black art of sending the human race upon an endless adventure into a promised land that is never reached. The perpetual sacrifice of today for a future that never becomes a present. Well, Ross Hoffman was encouraged to witness a revival in the, of interest in the idea of human rights, with, for example, the founding of the United Nations at the end of the Second World War. And he said, it seems unlikely that men can long continue talking about human rights without asking themselves why humans have rights. And so raising again the great questions concerning human nature that an evolution-minded generation ignored. In other words, we've got here the makings of an intellectually informed religious revival. If you think of, of, of mankind as simply a biological product of evolution, it's very, very difficult to have the idea of rights. But if you think of a man as a divine being who's, uh, who's part of a structured order of existence itself, then rights begin to make more sense. Russell Kirk became America's leading exponent of traditionalist conservatism with his surprise bestseller, The Conservative Mind, published in 1953. Kirk encouraged the idea that America was experiencing a new conservative renaissance. Kirk was the son of a Michigan train driver with mildly socialist views. He was drafted into the army in the Second World War and presided as a sergeant over the paperwork at a chemical weapons testing base in the southwestern desert, a bizarre setting, especially for someone of his temperament, but one which gave him plenty of leisure, the time to read extensively and to begin to rethink his political commitments. After the Second World War, he went as a graduate student to St Andrews University in Scotland, and he wrote his, uh, his dissertation there on the history of conservatism. Now, Scotland in the late 1940s was still, in, in some respects, a very backward place. Post-war rationing was still in effect. It was still very otherworldly by American standards, still very hierarchical, with kindly squires and, and Scottish barons, very few motor cars, and a feeling of, of ancient simplicity which resonated with Kirk. 
It certainly appealed to his instinctive love of antiquity and eccentricity. Back in America, he got a job as an instructor at Michigan State University, and he hated it. He called it Behemoth University and was ruthlessly scornful of all the vocational training that was taking place there. He'd already been influenced by Irving Babbitt, one of the new humanists who also detested vocational education. And it was while he was working at Michigan State that he met and befriended Richard Weaver, the author of Ideas Have Consequences. He was absolutely astonished by his own success with the conservative mind. It was nearly as much of a sensation as Whitaker Chambers' book Witness. And this was further evidence, incidentally, that there was nothing dull about intellectual life in the 1950s, although that's an assertion which has often subsequently been made. Both these books were bursting with ideas and with polemic and with emotional intensity. Russell Kirk, in The Conservative Mind, placed Burke also front and centre in his pantheon. And he judged all other conservatives in light of what he argued were Burke's central principles. He said, quote, The essence of social conservatism is preservation of the ancient moral traditions of humanity. And Kirk then went on in the early, uh, the early chapter of the book to summarise the six universal principles or canons of the conservative outlook. And the very first one was religious. One, belief that a divine intent rules society, as well as conscience, forging an eternal chain of right and duty, which links great and obscure, living and dead. Political problems, at bottom, are religious problems. Kirk's second principle was that it's better to love the mystery and diversity of life than to try to standardise the world and its people. Uniformity of all kinds, said Kirk, is false, and it's likely to be tyrannical as well. Third, societies should not only be diverse, they should also be class stratified. Hierarchy is natural, leadership is natural, and everybody craves it. And an equal society finds it difficult to repose its full faith in adequate leaders. Fourth, said Kirk, property is the economic foundation of liberty. If individuals can't, or families can't own property, they can't really be free. They don't have a place on which to stand to oppose the, the, the forces that threaten them. And property certainly can't be equalised without the tyrannical intervention of govern, intrusive government. Fifth, emotion is more powerful than reason. And we have to be very careful to discipline our emotions and not to let our ideas run away with us. Tradition is a, is a benevolent force, not least because it's a check on our intellectual pride. It constantly reminds us that we can't think through every, every problem and every principle right from, the, from original premises. We've got to rely on tradition and we've got to rely on the emotions which our actual circumstances generate. Sixth, said Kirk, conservatives don't oppose change. Change is inevitable. But they favour caution and respect for the past in adapting to new circumstances. Well, along with these six general principles, which he then illustrates in operation in the years since the life of Burke, right up to his own time, he identified the five greatest threats to conservatism. And here's what he said about them. They were the rationalism of the philosophes, that is the French philosophers of the 18th century who believed that, that purely rational planning was possible, the romantic emancipation of Rousseau and his allies, the utilitarianism of the Benthamites, the positivism of Comte's school, and the collectivistic materialism of Marx and other socialists. In Kirk's view, these movements were threatening because they violated the natural law foundations of reality. They despised tradition. They believed in the perfectibility of man. And they advocated, in one way or another, political and economic levelling. Russell Kirk was a passionate anti-communist, but he warned his contemporaries that American capitalism, like communism, was a materialist system that neglected spiritual values. Here he was making a comparable point to that made by the Southern Agrarians. They had said in 1930, the problem with capitalism is that it's much too similar to communism. It's a philosophically materialist system. And this was a point with which uh, Kirk agreed. Of his own world, he wrote that America was now a world smudged by industrialism, standardised by the masses, consolidated by government, 
A world crippled by war, trembling between the colossi of East and West, and peering over a smashed barricade into the gulf of dissolution. This, our era, is the society Burke foretold. And as you can tell from that description, he, like Weaver, thought it was a dreadful world, as industrialization had made it worse, not better. Well, it's possible to regard Russell Kirk as the creator, rather than merely the recorder, of the Anglo-American conservative tradition. He certainly was highly selective in, in who he was willing to put into the, conserv the conservative tradition. He excluded all the libertarians, and he drew a veil over such issues as American slavery and the American Civil War. As you read the book, you could be forgiven for not noticing that slavery had ever existed, and, and, and for somehow eliding the American Civil War altogether. Nevertheless, The Conservative Mind is a, a great book, very, very interesting, despite such obvious faults. It's still today one of the two or three books that everyone coming to the Conservative movement for the first time should read, whether they're going to become a Conservative or whether they're simply interested in it as an intellectual phenomenon. In it, the author's voice often merges with the voices of the people he's writing about. Now, it's surprising that this was, in a way, it's surprising that it was accepted as his doctoral dissertation. Because normally dissertation advisors, including me, are very, very emphatic that the student's voice has got to be separated from the voices of the people he or she is talking about. But what Kirk repeatedly does is he begins by talking about Burke or about one of the other conservatives, and gradually his voice merges with Kirk's voice, so that you can't really tell who's saying what. This, it was a work of advocacy and a polemic on, on behalf of conservatism, as well as a study of it. But as these quotations suggest, Kirk hated industrialization and loved hierarchy and was looking to restore a reverence for tradition which he seemed, which he felt was so severely missing. He seemed to have believed that in a strongly hierarchical society of the kind he wanted, the lowly, the people in the lowest social positions, would be satisfied with their lowliness. Now certainly British history gives some evidence in support of that idea, but American history really doesn't. The ideology of, of democracy and equality had been so strong for so long that it was very, very difficult to believe that traditionalism in America could ever mean making the lower classes content with the idea of their lower classness. It's a book which makes exacting demands on the reader. And when you read The Conservative Mind, you really need to be surrounded by dictionaries and encyclopedias and reference books of various kinds, because he's constantly throwing out ideas without full explanations of them. And the book ends with an expression of hope. In both great English-speaking nations, conservatism has manifested a political and intellectual continuity for nearly 165 years, while the radical parties that detested tradition have dissolved in succession, adhering as a movement to no common principle except hostility to whatever is established. Conservatives have retreated a long way since the French Revolution began. Now and then they have fled headlong. But they have not despaired when they were beaten. And today, when the ranks of radicalism are decimated, timorous and afflicted by internecine ferocity, conservatism has such an opportunity for regaining ground as it has not seen since that day when modern radicalism issued its challenge to traditional society by decorating the Hotel de Ville with human heads on pikes. In other words, not since the French Revolution began with an outbreak of brutality has conservatism had such an opportunity as it now has. Kirk himself cultivated his own image as a rustic sage. He lived in the remote Michigan village of Macosta. He couldn't drive a car. He used a very, very old mechanical typewriter. He was fiercely not up to date. And into, right into the last days of his life in the 1990s, uh, refused to use a computer. He wrote poetry and he wrote ghost stories. Somebody compared him to the elves who lived at Rivendell in The Lord of the Rings. And he was delighted by this kind of comparison. He loved the idea of having his little rural outpost to which conservative pilgrims would come to sit at his feet. And he did in fact become the grand old man of traditionalist conservatism, working at night, writing to a huge array of, of correspondence and sleeping during the days. A brilliant writer and a, a wonderful eccentric. Natural law ideas, central to the work of Weaver and Kirk, also influenced the journalist Walter Lippmann and the historian Peter Vierek. 
Littman's Essays in the Public Philosophy, published in 1955, another of the fascinating political books of the 50s, endorsed the idea that natural law offered our civilization a firm moral foundation. By the 50s, Lippmann was one of the two or three best respected and most influential journalists in America, a columnist whose work was read throughout the entire nation. Now, as a young man, Lippmann had been an idealistic socialist back in the days of the First World War. But he'd become progressively disenchanted by advertising, propaganda, and by the ease with which the public could be misled or manipulated. He was horrified by communism and Nazism, these systems which uprooted all tradition. And now, after the Second World War, he began to seek the security of the natural law, whose principles were immutable. Littmann said, A large plural society cannot be governed without recognising that, transcending its plural interests, there's a rational order with a superior common law. This common law is natural in the sense that it can be discovered by any rational mind, that it is not the willful and arbitrary positive command of the sovereign power. This is the necessary assumption without which it is impossible for different peoples, with their competing interests, to live together in peace and freedom within one community. Well, Littmann was another non-Catholic. Like Richard Weaver and Russell Kirk, exploring resources in the Catholic tradition, not so much for their religious value, as for the way they created a sure foundation for preserving society and civilization itself. The 1950s was a, very, um, was a period of intense ferment inside the American Catholic community, and as many of its ideas became more respectable, so were the Catholic people themselves, now second, third or fourth generation immigrants, and very soon to give rise in John F. Kennedy to the first Catholic presidential candidate, uh, after whose presidency the anti-Catholicism, which had been so strong for so long, began to evaporate. Peter Vierek became the favoured new conservative for many liberal intellectuals. In 1949, Virek won the Pulitzer Prize for poetry. He was a professor of history at Mount Holyoke College. And he was a conservative of a kind, but one who hated McCarthyism. He saw McCarthy as vulgar, an affront to decent people. Virek sympathised with the New Deal, and he scoffed at libertarians as the opposite of real conservatives. His view was that, that Franklin Roosevelt had saved capitalism, and, and in that sense had done a conservative job. Not a popular point among many conservatives at that time, but nevertheless uh, a defensible one. And he made the same kind of argument in favour of the natural law that Littmann had made. And a very strong argument for Christianity as the foundation of American society. Because over two millennia, Christianity had synthesised the best of all the systems of ideas that it had encountered. Its certainty of man's sinfulness made it appreciate the need to restrain the passions. And here's a characteristic passage from Peter Virak explaining the, the value of Christianity. Christianity is the needed time capsule, conserving and fusing the four ancestries of Western man, the stern moral commandments and social justice of Judaism, the love for beauty and for untrammeled intellectual speculation of the free Hellenic mind, the Roman Empire's universalism and its exaltation of law, and the Aristotelianism, Thomism and anti-nominalism included in the Middle Ages. Society is ever fusing them in new proportions to meet the ever-shifting emphasis on morality, beauty, intellect, legalism or universality. To some degree, all must be present. The razor's edge tension of the delicate and vulnerable balance between them is perhaps what goads Western man to greatness and gives him his creativity, his elan. In other words, Christianity has gathered together all that's best in these multiple heritages and created this vulnerable but beautiful and creative civilization. Well, Peter Virac's an important figure because he did much to give the new conservatism, as it gathered force after World War II, a respectable reputation. And, it, and his work forced at least some liberal intellectuals to consider its claims more seriously than they otherwise would have done.